Hey, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. Happy Women's History Month. Black Health Matters wants to welcome you to the Gynecologic Health Webinar today, What Black Women Should Know, sponsored by ASI. And ASI is a fully integrated pharmaceutical business focused on human health care. My name is Azizi Blissett, and I will be your moderator today. I'm a group account director here at Black Health Matters, the nation's leading health, wellness, and chronic disease education multimedia platform dedicated to improving health outcomes in communities across the country. To stay connected, please visit us at blackhealthmatters.com. And also, I want to encourage you to visit spotherforec.com to learn more about an initiative to help end the silence around endometrial cancer. I like to give a special thanks to our co-hosts, Chicago Medicine Comprehensive Cancer Center and Advocate Aurora Health, including the Partners of Faith Health Network community that is viewing this presentation from Advocate Trinity Health in Chicago, Illinois this morning. I would also like to welcome everyone who is attending virtually today. Just by being here today, you are joining a very vital conversation about gynecological health and uterine cancer that impacts women around the world, especially women of color. Uterine cancer incidence and mortality rates are on the rise with the highest rates happening in black and brown communities. So identifying symptoms and seeking help is especially important in our communities where there are significant disparities in health care. Today, to get us started with this discussion, I would like to turn the program over to our patient advocate and gynecologic cancer survivor, Regina Hammock. Gynecologic cancer is one of the world's biggest kept secrets, but also one of the world's biggest afflictions of women. Throughout time, we have been inundated with the wealth of information about breast cancer and its devastations by our personal relationships and experiences and the media. And yes, every now and again, we have heard things about uterine cancer, but information falls short about the variant and different kinds of gynecologic cancers. And no, there isn't any competition of any cancer, but there most definitely needs to be more recognition in our communities. Although there wasn't a name given to the condition, we are all aware that there was a woman with an issue of blood in biblical history. This story isn't new. Thank you for having me today. Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. My name is Regina Hammock. I am a 54 year old survivor of a gynecologic cancer diagnosed as endometrial stromal sarcoma. Today, I've been invited to speak to you, not as a doctor, as a survivor. With experience being the best teacher, I have come to give you my account and story of my journey, travail. First, let me inform you of the main types of gynecologic cancers, of which there are five. There's cervical cancer, which originates in the cervix, ovarian cancer that starts in the ovaries, uterine cancer slash endometrial cancer that originates in the uterus, vaginal cancer that begins in the vaginal canal, and vulvar cancer that starts in the external part of the female genitalia. To bring us closer to where my story begins, I'll name the two main types of uterine cancers, endometrial and uterine sarcoma. For clarification, uterine and endometrial cancers are often used interchangeably because they both affect the uterus. They are different and are diagnosed and treated differently. And although I am a survivor of endometrial cancer, my diagnosis is considered a form of uterine sarcoma because it started in the connective tissue cells called stromal cells of my endometrium. The endometrium is the inner lining of the uterus. My backstory, when I was nine years old, I thought that my liver was coming out. And <laughs> instead of letting my mother know, uh, I thought I would just die silently so my family wouldn't be sad. When my older sister washed the clothes, she told my mother that I had started my period. I mean, I didn't know. I was too young to have had sex education. 
let's talk to our girls earlier about this life changing event. I thought it was the end for me. So with all that happening so soon in life, I developed really fast. I also experienced very painful and heavy menstrual cycles each month. I would be in pain for the first day and continue with heavy bleeding and soaking through pads for the rest of my cycle for years to come. When I was in my early 30s, my gynae told me that I had fibroids and that they needed to be removed by a, a partial hysterectomy. I don't recall him giving an explanation or even telling me the effects that this life change in surgery would have on me. Because I already had five kids, all boys, I wasn't disappointed to later learn that I could not have any more children. Also, if I'm being honest, no more periods with no certainty that I, that I couldn't have kids anymore with the certainty made my life and sex life the better. Honestly, I was carefree for the first time in over two decades. No pain, no blood, and no more kids. <laughs> for Regina, win, win, win. There used to be a false narrative about hysterectomies that scared women into not wanting the procedure because it was told that you weren't feminine anymore or desirable. Honey, the lies that were told because I was truly living my best life and very desirable. It can be life-saving. But due to my cycle starting at a very young age, it made me a high risk for gynecologic cancer because of my extended periods throughout my lifetime. Later in my early 40s, I was experiencing uh, severe abdominal pain on my left side. I was diagnosed with ovarian cysts. For that, I had to have a unilateral salpingo oophorectomy, which was the removal of my left ovary. Because I did not have a full hysterectomy, I still had my ovaries. Not too many years later, after another bout with severe abdominal pain on my left side, I was then diagnosed with endometrial stromal sarcoma, resulting from a mass in the lining of my endometrium. The devastation of the diagnosis was, I don't know, devastating. It was 2017, I had my husband who had lost his first wife to lymphoma, a couple of grandkids, my children, and a full life. You really can't describe that initial shock, especially when you're the first in your immediate family to ever be diagnosed with any type of cancer. But I made a conscious decision that I would take on this treatment like a champ. I didn't let everyone know we all are different and we all need different things to help us get through. I'm the type of person that needs to process deal, then come out shining. I don't like the poo-poo face of, oh, I'm so sorry. I knew that God had me and I would prevail. After my diagnosis, I was referred to go back to see the doctor who had performed my uh, ovary removal. He decided that I would get made chemotherapy, which consists of four medications. The chemotherapy was administered for five days inpatient monthly for five months. I do believe that it was treated too aggressively for a low grade cancer. After receiving the treatment, I visited the cancer treatment centers in 2018, right before my 50th birthday, where I was told there was no cancer detected. Oh, glory, hallelujah, and thanksgiving. Today, I think that when it comes to your body, it is beneficial to seek out a doctor that can identify with you and your experiences. I heard from another survivor that the treatment she received from Dr. Lee, who's with us today, was phenomenal. I am so happy to be in connection with Dr. Lee again through Gina Curry. I have referred others to see guidance and cons consultation from her for that gy gynecologic quest. During that ordeal, God gave me the vision for my nonprofit, Hey Sister, helping elevate you, sister, so that I can help shine light on this quiet as kept disease that can be treated more successfully with early detection and prevention. Please help us all combat this oftentimes preventable disease by disseminating information and discussions because black health matters. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Regina, for that passionate story that you shared with us in your journey. We, we really appreciate that. Um, we appreciate the time that you are spending with us. 
um, this afternoon or this morning, wherever you're dialing in from. Thank you for having me. You are so welcome. Thank you. I want to um, go ahead and introduce um, a couple of dynamic women at this time. We have two doctors that are joining us. So I want you to please be able to, if I can get you guys to, if you're not muted, if you could go ahead and turn yourself on mute. I can, I can get you guys to go ahead and mute yourself because I'm hearing some background noise. Okay, so I'd like to go ahead and introduce um, a couple of dynamic doctors. Please help me welcome Dr. Kina Peppers. She's a board certified OBGYN, retired veteran, Lieutenant Colonel in the Army Medical Corps with over 24 years of service. She did two tours in the red zone of Iraq, earning her a bronze star. As an accomplished OBGYN with over 20 years of medical expertise and delivering comprehensive health care, Dr. Kina has faced her own personal health crises. She is a best-selling author of Shattered But Not Broken, a doctor's transformational journey from illness to resilience. She is a women's healthy lifestyle coach and CEO of All In Phenomenally, where she has a passion to empower women with chronic illnesses who want to make lifestyle changes, learn and practice healthy habits to have a better quality of life. She earned her medical degree from the Chicago Medical School, Roseland Franklin University, and completed her residency at the University of Illinois Medical Center in Chicago as chief resident. She is a member of the American Board of Obstetrics, Obstetrics <laughs> and Gynecology. Um, Dr. Kina is focused on patient outcomes and total well-being. Um, I've had the pleasure of talking to Dr. Kina uh, over the phone, and she is truly a dynamic woman, and I'm excited to learn a little bit more about her during this webinar. So please uh, help me welcome uh, Dr. Kina Peppers. Hello, 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 everybody. I, 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 it is just such a pleasure uh, to be here. I am so glad that I was invited. And um, I just want to first of all say that uh, Regina, you have a awesome story. And yes, you are gifted by God who brought you through all of these trials and tribulations. And I am, uh, I'm glad to meet you here. And um, I definitely will contact you so I can find more about, um, uh, more about your business. Hey, sister, I love it. <laughs> so um, it I It is a pleasure meeting you as well. Thank <laughs> you. I look forward to it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, and I want to say, Hello to everyone that is there at Trinity. I, uh, I've been there before and spoken with all of you wonderful, beautiful women. Um, thank you for the invitation. And I'm just going to give uh, about 10 minutes on um, things that you go to see your gynecologist about and how you need to make sure that these things are done and um, how you can look forward to having your next annual exam. So uh, Regina kind of spoke on some of these things, but when you go in to have your annual exam, it typically would include a pap smear. And yes, the pap smear is how we diagnose any abnormal precancerous cells on your cervix or any cervical cancer. So um, it always starts off with a pap smear. And if you have an abnormality with your pap smear, then we move to do a cervical biopsy. And um, not to go into any great detail, but during that cervical biopsy, we basically are able to look at your cervix, stain your cervix with a solution that makes those abnormal cells turn white. We look at it using a microscope and decide where we want to take the biopsies from. We take those biopsies and then 
the last thing we do is scrape the cervix because the brush that we use when we do your pap smear, a little bit of that brush goes into the cervix and the rest of it swabs the exterior portion of the cervix. So then we scrape that area to see if the cells that are in that, that opening to the uterus are abnormal. And then we go from there as far as what the next step would be. And um, that right there is a blessing in itself is that we actually do have the ability to test to see if you have any abnormal cells on your cervix so that we can intervene when it's necessary. And that intervention could include just getting that, what I call a colposcopy where the cervix is biopsied. And um, even if let's say that you have an abnormality, when we get that back and it's not cancer yet, we actually still have the ability to go in and remove those cells in the operating room. And then your cervix will grow back on its own. So the, the cervix is very forgiving. And so it's almost like when you go to the ice cream store and you are getting ice cream and no one has gotten any ice cream out of that bucket yet. And you take a scooper and you scoop the ice cream, just one scoop of that ice cream. The scoop contains the abnormal cells. And then what you see left is a little divot in the cervix. That cervix then grows back and it grows back in hopes that your next pap smear will be normal. So when we talk about abnormal cells on the cervix, getting your pap smear, cervical cancer, we can't help but to talk about the Gardasil vaccine. So the Gardasil vaccine um, is something that we would want everyone to have. Initially, when it came out, I believe it was from age nine to 26. And um, we, I got a little pushback from moms who said, oh, this is allowing my daughter to have sex early. But the whole point behind it is we want to give the vaccine prior to any exposure to having sex or having uh, exposure to getting the human papilloma virus. So the human papilloma virus, or we call it HPV, is a sexually transmitted virus that actually can cause cervical cancer. And just you getting that Gardasil vaccine can decrease your risk of cervical cancer by like 90%. So this is, um, this is wonderful. And what happened was over time, they went from age 26 to now 45. So you can still get the Gardasil vaccine up to age 45 and still be uh, get protection against the human papillomavirus that leads to cervical cancer. So in that office visit, um, cervical cancer is definitely at the top of the list. The other thing that I want to talk about, as Regina was saying, how she had these really, really heavy mm -hmm. cycles. Mm -hmm. So we get a lot of, I get tons of women who come in that have heavy vaginal bleeding. And, you know, when you come in, a lot of times women will have heavy vaginal bleeding and they don't really realize that their bleeding is so heavy because it may have either always been like that. And that's just something that you don't sit around and talk to your girlfriends about and say, oh, how many pads per day do you use? So sometimes people will have vaginal bleeding when I ask questions and they don't really realize that it's heavy vaginal bleeding and that it's abnormal. So some of the things that have to be done when you have this heavy vaginal bleeding is I always get some labs. And in those labs, it will include the hormones that regulate your menstrual cycle to make sure that those hormones are normal. Because if there's like a hormonal problem, it's possible that something needs to be fixed in order to decrease the amount of bleeding that you have. Um, we also check to see what your hemoglobin A1C is. And that is how your uh, blood glucose has been um, over the last three months. But it also includes all of those hormones that regulate your menstrual cycle. 
and also an insulin level. And the reason why is because a lot of people who have have heavy vaginal bleeding can actually have polycystic ovarian syndrome. And polycystic ovarian syndrome, those patients may have a lot of um, estrogen because the estrogen that regulates your menstrual cycle uh, comes from your ovaries. However, we also have estrogen that comes from our fat cells. And the combination of those two make the lining of your uterus much thicker. And because the lining of the uterus is thicker, you may have patients who only have three periods a year. However, when they have a period, it's like a torrential downpour. And because they have the absence of the cycle, the cells that are inside of the uterus can become abnormal and they can become precancerous. So whether you are coming in because you have heavy menstrual bleeding and we do ultrasound to see what the lining looks like, see what the ovaries look like, see if the uterus is enlarged, that ultrasound helps to guide us in how thin or thick the lining of the uterus is. So the estrogen com contributes to how thick the lining of the uterus is. And when you have your cycles, it's the lining of the uterus that actually sheds. And that's what you see on your tampon or your pad. With that lining being thickened, that gives us more suspicion that the cells may be abnormal and it needs to be evaluated. So then you shift to women who are postmenopausal. Once you are postmenopausal without a period for an entire year, you should never, ever, ever bleed again. And if you do bleed, that bleeding needs to be evaluated. And once again, we would do the ultrasound. So we're talking about three different sets of people. However, each person, whether you have heavy bleeding, whether you have the fibroids, whether you have polycystic ovarian syndrome, or whether you're postmenopausal, all of those need to be evaluated. And the one thing that we do is an endometrial biopsy. This allows us to sample the cells that line the uterus. And in sampling the cells that line the uterus, it is an inpatient, I'm sorry, an uh, outpatient procedure that's done right inside of the, the office. And that tells us about those cells. And I've had a lot of patients who come in to have that procedure done. And just from doing the procedure, they may be diagnosed with, um, with uterine cancer or even patients who come into the operating room to have a hysterectomy who have had a normal uh, endometrial biopsy or a normal pap smear may have cervical cancer that is inside of the uh, cervix itself, unable to reach when you do your pap smear or women who have uterine cancer that may not have been reached when the endometrial biopsy was done. So there's a lot of different things um, that go on with that. But the one thing that I actually talk to my patients about is obesity actually increases your risk of so many different cancers. And just what we've talked about today, being cervical, ovarian, uh, uterine cancer, um, because obesity increases the risk of those different cancers, I always tell my patients that they should live as much of a healthy lifestyle that you possibly can live to decrease those chances. So that means, you know, you're getting on the right diet and it's not a diet, quote, diet, it's living healthy. And in living healthy, and um, you actually will lose some weight because you living the best life that you can live. So living that healthy lifestyle decreases those chances of getting those different types of cancers. However, it also decreases the risk of high blood pressure, diabetes, coronary artery disease. So in my book, I promote all of that 
because living healthy allows you to have a healthy lifestyle, prolong your life, and those are the things that we would want to do. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that information uh, with us. Mm -hmm. We're gonna continue to move this program along. Um, I wanna introduce another dynamic powerhouse um, for you all, um, Dr. Karnick, Dr. Nita Karnick Lee um, is an associate professor of obstetrics, I can't know why I keep getting tongue tied, obstetrics and gynecology assistant director at the University of Chicago Comprehensive Cancer Center, Community Outreach and Engagement. Dr. Lee provides comprehensive, compassionate care to those diagnosed with ovarian, uterine, cervical, vulvar, or vaginal cancers. Dr. Lee believes in a personalized approach to treatment that includes tailored surgery, chemotherapy, clinical trials, and supportive care. Her dedication is to her patients, and one of the many reasons she has been named a top doctor in gynecologic oncology by Chicago Magazine. In addition to her clinical practice, Dr. Lee is focused on patient-centered research and cancer survivorship and disparities, such as lifestyle changes and psychosocial needs of gynecologic cancer survivors. She also leads the University of Chicago Woman to Woman Program, a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring program for gynecologic cancer survivors. As part of the Comprehensive Cancer Center Community Outreach and Engagement Leadership Team, Dr. Lee demonstrates her commitment to supporting community collaboration and education to reduce cancer disparities. She is a passionate patient advocate and partners with organizations and survivors in their advocacy and education efforts. Please welcome Dr. Lee, who will share a presentation and provide us a more in-depth perspective on this topic. Thank you, everybody, very much, um, Ms. Hammock, Dr. Peppers. I know we've shared patients before in the past as well, um, and so I'm really thankful for this 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 opportunity to talk to everybody. And I think what's been said already really sets the stage for kind of taking a little bit of a deeper dive into when gynecologic problems can actually kind of be a little bit more serious and need the workup that could lead to a diagnosis of cancer. And I think a lot of what's been said also is so important in terms of the symptoms and the good connections with physicians. And as Dr. Pepper explained, like really understanding the whole process so you can educate yourself, but then also kind of, you can, you know, I always think anybody who listens to any talks that were are given, you know, has the responsibility and the ability to kind of share that information. So we sort of amplify what that is. And so that's what I'm going to jump into here. Um, and I'll go a little bit faster through some of the topics that have been covered to leave room for questions. I believe I will share screen. I always, that always makes me nervous. Like, is it working? Um, and I think that you should be able to see this. Is that correct? Okay. I apologize because my screen is like over there. So I'm not looking straight on, but I, I, but I am, um, you know, hearing everything here. So I'm going to go ahead and get started and hope that I can get through my, oh, here it is. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about GYN cancers, understanding the risks, prevention, and treatment options. So uterine cancer and GYN cancers in general are sometimes not discussed as much because they're not as common as Regina mentioned. So when you think about breast cancers, unfortunately, there's about almost close to 300,000 women a year who are diagnosed with breast cancer. Uterine cancer is the most common GYN cancer, and that includes kind of what Regina and had spoken about, like the different types of uterine cancer that can arise. But uterine cancer is actually increasing, and it's about between 65 and 66,000 women per year. And in, in the other cancers that were mentioned, ovarian, cervix, vulvar, you can see that they're a lot less common. So again, this isn't you know, this is more just to raise awareness to common to things that people don't always think about. And I do think somebody mentioned this earlier, sort of like the below the belt cancers, there's still a little bit of a taboo about talking about it. And I think we want to kind of break that taboo as well. 
So general symptoms to seek GYN care, um, really listening to your own body, but a lot of these are very common. So cervical cancer, we often think about abnormal vaginal bleeding, ovarian cancer has, and I'll get into these a little bit more detailed. This is a little checklist. It's important though, to think through all of these symptoms, bleeding, discharge, feeling full, eating too, difficulty eating, pelvic pain or pressure, more frequent need to urinate or constipation, bloating, abdominal or back pain, changes in the skin on the outside of the genital areas or the vulva. And I think paying attention to what your body is telling you and what seems different and new. So if these symptoms are kind of going on for two weeks or longer, they're, they're not, you know, they're, they're different and they're not, they're new for you, making sure you're seeing a gynecologist so that you can actually get the right workup like Dr. Peppers mentioned. And there is some differences in how these cancers can present, but in general, I think it's really this idea of like advocating for yourself and others to kind of get that push for the diagnosis. So about over 100,000 women will be diagnosed with one of the five GYN cancers every year. And so that leaves us with about almost 600 to 700,000 women who are either living with the cancer or who have survived the cancer and maybe living with some of the side effects of the cancer treatments as well. So that's something to think about. I also like to think about building your team for your best GYN care. So I think this involves like oftentimes a primary care doctor. I really think it should involve an OBGYN for all women, even after menopause, because I feel that gynecologists, as gynecologists, we're more focused on women's issues and women's care. And sometimes it can involve a GYN oncologist if your OBGYN or your primary care doctor thinks there's something that's more concerning. So probably about 75% of my patients get referred to me because they have a known cancer or a very highly suspicious cancer based on something they've had a workup for. And about 25% may be seeing me because their OBGYN wants to kind of say like, hey, let's get another opinion about this. I'm worried about this cyst or, hey, I've already done a workup for cervical cancer, but I'm worried about other things. And so it's really important. As a GYN oncologist, people don't know what, what we do, but we're a specialist who specializes only in GYN cancer. We do surgery and chemotherapy, but we kind of serve as like the quarterback role for when somebody's diagnosed with the GYN cancer to say like, hey, like what should we be, um, you know, what, what, what do we need to do for your treatment? But also building your care for social support and emotional and mental health support is equally important. And that can come from a lot of different places. So when we think about GYN cancers, we can kind of see like the cancers kind of differ in terms of the age group of when things happen. Cervical cancer tends to happen in a little bit of a younger age group and uterine cancer tends to happen around or right after menopause. But we do see it's really important to think about women over 60 because some of those patients are less likely to be attached to their OBGYN. And this is really critically important because women, after we've kind of done with childbearing and maybe we're not worried about that anymore. We're kind of less likely to drift away from our favorite OBGYN back to just a primary care doctor. And thinking about having that link, I still think is very important. Now, that's a personal decision, but I think it, it this slide reflects that that there are still issues that happen throughout the life cycle and making sure you have a good connection to who can help you with that. So I want to, I think this is something that um, Dr. Peppers touched on, and I just really want to make sure that people understand the pelvic exam, usually annually, it used to be linked to an annual PAP, but some of the recommendations for how frequently we do a PAP has changed, but it's really important to know that like a pelvic exam doesn't mean that a pap smear or an HPV test was done. So many people feel like, hey, I had that speculum put in. I think I had my, my pap smear done, but they may not have. So asking about whether you've gotten that. So there's the speculum exam that we talk about, and then there's the bimanual exam where we feel. And we kind of talked a little bit about the different problems and the things that can show up, and that may lead to more workup. So some fast facts before we get to intermedial cancer, cervical cancer, cancer that starts in the cervix of the womb. Anyone with a cervix is as risk. It's the second most common cancer death for women who are younger, and it happens most commonly in women who are probably between 35 and 44. People who are most at risk are people who have not had a pap smear before or haven't had a pap for at least five years. And it's really caused by a very, very common infection called HPV that like everybody has essentially of high risk type. 
And as Dr. Peppers really, um, you know, described, if it's caught early, it can be treated early and really prevented, essentially, or precancers can be prevented. And we also talked, she also mentioned a little bit about the HPV vaccine. So cervical cancer, just the take-home messages, risk factors, not having a pap test, earlier age of starting intercourse, smoking. So this is one that people don't think about. We often think about lung cancer, but smoking can actually increase your risk of, of, um, of cervical cancer. A higher risk male partner. So that sometimes means that, you know, this is difficult because some patients feel like, well, I've only been with one partner. How could I be at risk? Right. And it's not that anyone, like anyone could have just one partner and still be at risk. So that's important, but it, it is important to think about these different factors. Also, how is your immune system? Some things we can't really measure about the immune system, but sometimes in patients who have HIV or a transplant, like a kidney transplant or a heart or lung transplant or any, you know, kidney is the one that I most commonly see, um, these patients are less likely to fight off the infection. The symptoms though, if you don't find it during a pap, can be vaginal bleeding. Again, this is a common theme, work up for vaginal bleeding, very, very important bleeding after intercourse. So just like, you know, that's something that people sometimes are embarrassed to talk about, but it's a really important symptom. Discharge, pain, blood, even back pain or leg swelling. So we know that cervical cancer, pap tests, check the cells of the cervix, HPV tests, checks for the virus, 21 until 65. But remember, if you haven't gotten regular tests, you can actually get tested after 65 and Medicare will cover it. And so that's really important. And so this could, these guidelines can be confusing. So just making sure you're up to date and asking your doctor um, about that. HPV vaccine, quick facts, nine to 45, really? Under 14, you can get two shots. It can prevent 90% of HPV cancers, which are six different cancers, which include head and neck cancer, vulvar, vaginal, anal cancers. And so this is really important because in countries that started vaccinating all kids really early on, unlike the US, which has kind of done a little bit of a hodgepodge and we're getting better, those countries shows that the risk of cervical cancer, if you were vaccinated before age seven. 17 was 88% lower versus those who are never vaccinated. And that's amazing that we could provide our kids with a risk reduction like that for cancer. So surgery for cervical cancer, if it's early and small, and sometimes we can spare the uterus. Um, sometimes for cancers that are larger, we have to use chemotherapy and radiation. And these are designed specifically for each patient. I'm gonna jump into vulvar and vaginal cancers less common, even more below the belt, less discussed. It can be HPV related or it can be inflammation related. So again, common things, vaginal bleeding, bleeding after sex, pain, something that just does not seem right, discharge that's watery, feeling a lump. On the outside skin surface, it could be chronic itching, um, feeling bleeding, bumps, a wart-like appearance. And a lot of times I see, unfortunately, a lot of women who get given like a, a cream and said, oh, don't worry about it. Like, you know, your primary doctor gives you a cream, but nobody looks. And so making sure you're connected to a doctor is like a gynecologist who could look at the area and make an, a, a, you know, to see if there needs to be a small sample taken. I'm going to keep track of time here. Um, and ovarian cancer basics, unfortunately, most are diagnosed later in stage because of how ovarian cancer can spread quickly from the ovary surface throughout the abdominal wall cavity. Oops, sorry, I moved backwards. The symptoms, bloating, pelvic pain, difficulty eating. These are symptoms that are difficult because these are symptoms that all of us may have from one time or the other. So they're not like, you know, if you have bloating once, maybe that's okay, right? Or if you know that a certain food always triggers the same thing, that might be okay. But if this is new and different, like we, I just want to tell people like, don't take no for an answer, like get a workup, like make sure people are doing more tests to figure out what's wrong because that sometimes is where we, um, we are missed in terms of getting the diagnosis. So some of the risk factors for ovarian cancer, age, knowing your family history of breast and ovarian cancer are often linked together in something called BRCA, B-R-C-A mutations. And we know that minority women and black women are less likely to get genetic testing to figure out if things run in their family. And so that's really important. Infertility, having a personal history of cancer, early periods, late menopause, or endometriosis, which is a benign condition, but can predispose people. 
things that decrease birth control or decrease risk of ovarian cancer, birth control pills, pregnancy, tubal ligation, breastfeeding, or having a risk-reducing surgery to remove the tubes or ovaries. The surgery and the treatment for ovarian cancer is more complex, and that's why we really want those patients to be served by a gynecologic oncologist, because we know outcomes are better with a specialty surgeon for these cancers. We know that chemotherapy can be given before or after surgery, and most women will have about six months of chemotherapy, and some women will have maintenance chemotherapy after that, depending on their cancer type. Areas that we won't talk about today is thinking about surveillance, survivorship, a lot of, of what Dr. Peppers talked about, lifestyle, nutrition, energy, and activity, all of those things factor in, in terms of your, your whole wellness. And I think that's an important part of cancer care too. Genetic testing, again, emphasizing the need for that. So I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about uterine cancer. So it's the most common GYN cancer in the U.S. and it's rising. The endometrium, the inner lining the womb where a pregnancy is carried. Endometrial cancer is a cancer that grows in the lining and, and uterine sarcoma is a cancerous growth can, that can start in the muscle wall or the connective tissue. But we all kind of lump it together because so many of the symptoms are the same. So I think it's important to, ooh, did I miss one of my slides? Let's see. Yep, no, I did not. We know that uterine cancer is increasing, and this is really important to think about because we know that uterine cancer is on the rise, especially amongst Black women. And this is, I am glad that this is finally getting the attention because I've been doing this for about 20 years and we've known this for this long, but it's never gotten enough press. And I'm very thankful for researchers, patient advocates, um, and GYN oncologists who are focused on this area. So this is looking at in Illinois, for example, we're seeing Black women and the rise in how much more they're being diagnosed with endometrial cancer or uterine cancer. And then we're seeing kind of in general, all throughout the, all the different races and ethnicities, we're seeing a rise that continues. Multiple different reasons were for this. In women who are identified as Black, that is about one in 37 chance of a woman being diagnosed with a uterine cancer compared to cervical cancer, which is less common, and ovarian cancer, which is a little less common as well. But this is what the problem is. It's not just who's diagnosed with the cancer, it's who's dying of this cancer. And this is where the work really needs to be done on all fronts. Um, this is an unfortunate table of what how the rate of how women are dying from endometrial or uterine cancer. And here in this category all by itself here is non-Hispanic black women. And that is unacceptable. These are the patients that I've cared for. These are close friends of mine. These are, you know, like, and it is really just representative of like many, many different factors that can come in, but we need to kind of get at all those factors. And so having a seminar like this helps us get to some of these factors. Um, the multiple factors that can be linked have talked about delay in diagnosis. So Black women may be less likely to get a biopsy or less likely to be referred for ultrasound. And some of the factors that Ms. Hammock and Dr. Peppers mentioned were things like people's just saying, oh, it's fibroids, you know, oh, don't worry about it. That happens, you know, and sometimes that's things that people hear from their doctor, which is really a problem. And sometimes that's just because you know, a certain amount of bleeding may be acceptable because maybe you have a family history of having a lot of women with fibroids and people are like, oh, that's fibroids. I had the same thing. And those are, can be reassuring, but also can make people feel like they're not getting the care that they need. Access to care can be due to, um, you know, sometimes it can be due to things like people often talk about like insurance and different things like that. But sometimes it's just like people not hearing what your symptoms are and really doing the correct workup. And so part of what I think is really important is for women to understand what is the workup and what do you go in asking for? Um, symptoms that are dismissed, ultrasound may actually be less accurate in Black women because of fibroids or because of the type of endometrial cancers that they may be getting. There's some studies that show that decreased surgery is offered or even accepted. And we also know that a lot of the unfortunate deaths due to uterine cancer are driven by higher risk cell types. So not all uterine cancer is the same. The importance of understanding which cell type do I have and what is my doctor telling me about that is very, very important because that can make a difference in what treatment that we do. 
There's also some data suggesting that there's less treatment after surgery, which can actually be really needed in these higher risk types. We also know that we don't have enough good treatments for these high risk type, and that's you know another area. For these non these non endometriate or non like higher risk endometrial types, we know that the rate of deaths for black women are increasing at a much higher rate compared to white women, also in Asian women as well. So I think it's important to understand these differences. And so what I think about is that like, what do we need to know at all of these different phases, like symptoms and risk factors, steps and works up and diagnosis and treatment and aftercare options to kind of review that. Bleeding, pain, changes in bowel and bladder function, tamoxifen use. Um, I feel like I may have skipped over that slide somehow, but thinking about what are the true risk factors. I know Dr. Pepper um, jumped in on that and went over a lot of those about obesity related, but I wanted to mention tamoxifen use and family history. Oh, there's my slide. <laughs> um, ultrasound, biopsy, DNC, asking for those steps if you've had abnormal bleeding is critical. That I think is one of the biggest delays in getting people the diagnosis and being a, a fearful of what bleeding could mean. The majority of the time, it's not going to be in cancer, right? And it could be something that someone like Dr. Peppers or your OBGYN can help you figure out how to control if you're younger or older, either medically or surgically. But if you don't get that biopsy, we can miss things. Surgery, chemotherapy, I won't get into all of those things, but understanding that those are also things that we want to be there as GYN oncologists to be able to talk people through and really give you the details of what you would need and kind of think through. Oops. This is probably the most important thing in terms of symptoms. So long history of irregular cycles. My youngest patient who was diagnosed with endometrial uterine cancer was 26, and she had a very long history of, of irregular periods. Any bleeding after menopause really is a, is, is a warning signal. Abnormal bleeding anytime. Things that have changed, they're longer, they're heavier, something's unusual and doesn't feel right to you. Vaginal discharge, pain, decreased appetite, just other changes, you know. The risk factor, older age, so definitely after menopause, unfortunately being overweight, diabetes, separate from whether your weight is, a diet higher in fat, less physically active, estrogen hormone replacement is a little controversial because birth control pills can be protective. And if you have estrogen and progesterone combined, that can be protective. But if for some reason someone's getting estrogen only, that can be harmful tamoxifen. So many women I see have had a breast cancer before their uterine cancer is diagnosed. And tamoxifen is wonderfully protective against breast cancer, but increases the risk of uterine cancer. And many women don't know that. Family history. So there are linkages that can be genetic, which are um, colon and uterine are linked together through something called Lynch syndrome. So sometimes people don't even think about uterine cancer, but they know they have a huge family history of colon cancer. And that's really important to share. And polycystic ovary syndrome, as mentioned earlier. We know that abnormal bleeding and treatment is more effective when reached earlier. And that's really important. So uterine cancer, I won't mention too much about this, but really knowing that the endometrial biopsy is a really small, flexible thing that can be done in the office. A DNC is an outpatient procedure if you're kind of nervous about an office exam or maybe you have anxiety or, or a history of trauma or you know feel less comfortable in the office. You can always ask your doctor for, hey, can I do this in a different way? That's fair to ask and do. Um, sometimes we do ultrasound often. We want the lining to be nice and thin and sometimes it's not. And so that can be helpful too. So the treatment is usually surgery, the removal of the uterus and the cervix and the removal of the tubes and ovaries and other biopsies, sometimes including lymph nodes. Most women may not need surgery after, I mean, treatment after surgery, but um, the extra treatment, especially for those high-risk types is very, very important. And this is where I do think that there's a really big difference in how we need to make sure that Black women are getting GYN oncology referrals appropriately and their aftercare is treatment. Because we may do a great job in surgery, but if we don't follow that up with the standard of care that everybody deserves, then we're missing the whole cure, you know? Um, and just making sure that we know that specialized care is sometimes needed.
So again, kind of sharing these symptoms, making sure we're aware of those and advocating for yourself and others is, is, is critically important. So I'll kind of leave that so we have question time for questions, but listening to your body, advocating for workup, even if that means getting a second opinion or a new doctor um, and seeking care. So I thank you. I could talk about this for a really long time. So I will stop so that we can answer questions and everything else like that. Thank you so much. That was very informative. I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation, um, but I thoroughly enjoyed all of you all. At this time, I do want to acknowledge that I know we are almost at the top of the hour. I do want a lot time for question and answers. Um, we may run about five or 10 minutes over schedule. I just wanted to um, inform our participants of that. Um, I would like to open the floor up for discussion on any uh, questions we may have. I want to check in with Patricia Jackson in Chicago to see if you have any questions first in person uh, where you are. Thank you, Chantel. Izzy, I'm sorry. That's okay. I really appreciate that. Yes, we do have a question. Okay. I'll see, can I turn my camera around? Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, I'm Reverend Brown. And uh, the question I had was how does the perm, lady, they've been talking about the perm, the perm can cause uh, cancer. Uh, so can you explain that? She, it sounds like she's asking how does the perm uh, treatment um, is causing uh, the uterine cancer. Is that correct? Is that the yes. correct question? Okay. Yes. yes. I can take a stab at that because I've read this paper that, you know, and it was specifically on um, hair straighteners. And there was a large study done with women across the country for many years that showed that women who had used certain types of hair straighteners had an increased risk of uterine cancer. Mm -hmm. There were not as many Black women in the study altogether, and so they couldn't really tell whether Black women had a higher risk, but it really did start the conversation about relaxants and like, you know, hair products and, you know, and I think a, a really important issue of kind of like advocating of like, what are we putting into our bodies and knowing what that is. And so the link is been documented, but no one really knows the full extent of like who it's affecting most. And because there's so many different risk factors, you don't know why one combinations of somebody's like environment and health history and genetics could lead to uterine cancer. But that is an example of an environmental factor that we could think about changing and having, you know, restrictions on use of like products that could be toxic for, for patients. Okay. Um, any additional questions in the room? I'm going to, if yeah. not, move to, we do have another question. I'll get one yes. more question in the room and then we'll move into the Zoom questions that are popping up. Um, if I can get uh, Nikki with Black Health Matters to join to help with uh, answering some of the Zoom questions. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nikki Townsend. And I wanted, wanted to know, when did the HPV start? Because when I got diagnosed with endometrial cancer, Oh, uh, I never heard of that, the HPV. So when did that start? Okay. She wanted to know when did the HPV uh, vaccine start? The original HPV vaccine studies started in the early 2000s, but 2006 was, I believe, the first U.S., um, uh, like, the first U.S., time that it was like available widely. So we do have a lot of years of experience and internationally as well. Many countries, um, Rwanda, Australia, the UK, um, or some of the countries in the Netherlands have really adopted it as like a school-wide national strategy. And those are the countries that are starting to see declines in cervix cancer. Okay. Thank you. We'll just, I'm sorry, someone wanted to repeat the first question. Rosa, can you repeat that first question? Reverend Brown here. Oh, yeah. She asked the question, what, is, what do you think about perm, perming the hair, the chemical that you use in the perm that doesn't uh, cause, cause cancer? Okay. Thank you. So it sounds like they're asking, um, can you use the, can you perm the hair? What do you think about the chemicals that are used in the perm there treatment? Are, I mean, there, there, the study specifically was looking at 
hair relaxers. And so it's a little bit hard because like it was basically women who use chemical hair straighteners and relaxers may have a higher risk of uterine cancers. And this was a study that was published in October. And the hard part is like, it wasn't a detailed study of like which products it was specifically. And it was a little bit associated with like longer use. Um, but I think it reflects kind of like an environmental exposure and thinking about like what products we put into our body. And I think it's particularly important to make sure that we think about that because, you know, as as as, as we all know, many people start using those products very young age around puberty, around the time, you know, so the, the lifetime exposure may also be a part of it too. I think what it meant to me and what I've you know, talk to people about is like really thinking like more, you know, just being more aware of how these things that we don't think are related to your health can be related to your health, right? These exposures that get put into your skin or body or anything else like that. Um, that's how I would think of it. So I want to um, thank you. Uh, well, thank, I you. Want, thank you so much, Patricia. We're going to move to Zoom uh, questions now that we've had come in. Um, Nikki, if you can assist me with getting some of these questions answered. Again, once again, we are running a little bit behind, uh, probably by about five or 10 minutes. This is such a lively uh, discussion. I want to make sure that we get most of these questions answered. Um, and Dr. Pepper, you can certainly chime in and Regina, you can chime in at any given time on any of these questions that may be relevant for you. Um, Nikki, can you start with our first question from Zoom? Yes, and I'm gonna try to consolidate a few of these uh, in the interest of time. A um, Couple of questions about, are we seeing higher rates of ovarian cancer in black women? And if it's more widespread, with Black women, should we be looking at updated screening recommendations specifically for Black women? Um, for ovarian cancer, we're not seeing higher rates specifically. Unfortunately, ovarian cancer as well does have disparities in outcomes for that. And so I do think it's important to kind of think about because sometimes ovarian cancer gets labeled as like a, a white woman's disease, right? Like the picture that's on the face is like somebody who's older, menopausal and Caucasian. And that's not the face of ovarian cancer. It can be, you know, and there's also a lot of different types of ovarian cancer. Um, and then the second question was screening. There is no current screening recommendation for endometrial cancer. So getting a normal PAP does not mean that everything else is okay. So you can have a normal pap every year and still get diagnosed with uterine cancer the next month. Mm -hmm. It does not test the uterus. And so that's really important. I do think that there are some um, researchers who are looking to see, like, can we really change the script on like, hey, let's just not do ultrasound, but really do biopsy. I think people and I think naturally so, we want to make the guidelines work for everybody, but we don't want to make race-based guidelines because sometimes race-based guidelines can actually read down a pathway where people are over-treated and like penalized and thought to be you know, different in some way. And so it's a fine line. And so right now, I think the workup for bleeding is probably the focus. Okay. So- All right. Uh, Do we have room for one more as easy? We sure do. We have room for a couple more questions. Okay, awesome. Um, Dr. Lee, on the slide, uh, one of your slides mentioned that birth control pills decrease risk. Is there any increase or decreased risk found with having the 10-year or no hormone IUD? So um, I love the hormone IUD. There's a couple of brands. Morena IUD is a brand that is um, um, has like progesterone, which is a kind of like protective hormone in the lining. And that can be inserted for birth control, but that is actually protective against endometrial cancer and can be a treatment for endometrial cancer and precancer of the endometrium for women who want to save their uterus or for women who can't have surgery. So yes, that is actually very protective. Thank you for bringing that up. Awesome. Thank you. Another question mentions um, this attendee said she did not see or hear anything about uterine ablation surgery. Um, what has happened to this procedure? I don't know, Dr. Peppers, if you want to take that question. Yes, definitely. You know what I do? I actually do a lot of uterine ablations and um, it's really for the person who the uterus isn't huge. Um, and then the person who um, the uterus isn't large and then the endometrial biopsy is negative. 
So anybody who wants to get a uterine an ablation, they should have a normal endometrial biopsy, and then they should also not have a huge uterus. So the, the manufacturers, they have a cutoff, and they say that the uterus should not be more than 10 uh, centimeters. So it's like 10, 11, um, and I do a lot of those uterine ablations. Mm -hmm. And they're very simple. They're very simple. And I actually put a camera in. I take a before picture. And then after I burn the uterine lining down to the muscle where it can no longer grow, then I take an after picture. So patients can literally see the difference, the before and the after difference between, and then expect not to really have much bleeding or no bleeding at all. Thanks for answering that. Okay, again, we are going to stay on for about another five minutes or so here. Um, if that's okay with our panelists, just to get some of these questions answered, they're continuously coming in. I wanna go back to Patricia Jackson and Chicago to see if there are any questions in the room there. Thank you. Do we have any more questions in the room? Any other questions? No, we're excited okay. and we're still listening. Okay, thank you. So Nikki, if you can go on with our next question. Yes, should women continue to get pap smears after the age of 65? So the recommendations are that if you've had like normal pap smears, not had HPV, not had precancer, those kinds of things, then at age 65, you can stop. Unfortunately, many women that I meet have don't really know always what they did between 40s and 60s necessarily. And 20% of cervical cancers are diagnosed in women over 65, and they have a much higher death rate because they are often found later. So I think if you're turning 65 or you're in your 60s, kind of just either think back or reach out to your primary care doctor or gynecologist to say, hey, look, you know what? Let me just get this one more pap before I'm done and then get it and feel better. And everyone can kind of like, you know, be reassured about that. That's how I think of it. But I think people don't read the fine print. And a lot of times people have not had a pap smear for like 30 years, like just don't get one. And they're 70 and people like dismiss it and that shouldn't happen. Good to know. Thank you. Also, another question for women who have had a hysterectomy, are pap smears and physical screenings for cancer still necessary for those women? Oh, okay. You I want to take that one? We'll, we'll split yeah, it up. You take that one. <laughs> so um, if you have had a hysterectomy for a benign condition, so you had hysterectomy because you had uterine fibroids, then technically you don't need another pap smear. You, you, don't, you don't have a cervix because the pap smear actually is testing for cervical cancer. So you do not need a pap smear. I agree. And I think just like other, I still think though, even if you had a hysterectomy, like having somebody do a exam from time to time may be important, especially for the other cancers, like the vulvar outside cancers and things like that. And then I think, um, Regina, you mentioned like knowing the type of hysterectomy you had, like, did you have your ovaries removed or not? You know, that could be an important issue of like, maybe like keeping up with exams. And let me just, let me just piggyback on that. Um, the terminology has changed over the years. So it's a lot of women who come in and say, I had a partial. Yes, that's so true. Me. So it's important for you to know what partial means this, because hysterectomy in itself usually means that the uterus and the cervix were taken. Now it means the uterus, the cervix, and the fallopian tubes were taken. But when they say partial, does that mean that you're, you're, um, your ovaries were left behind yeah. or does partial mean that your cervix was left behind? Good so a point. lot of women come in and they say, I had a partial, but then when I do the, the uh, speculum exam, I see a cervix. That says, that is such a good point. <laughs> right. In my, in my case, I had my cervix removed and my ovaries were left. Got it. Okay. okay. So the name hysterectomy is the uterus. So this, the, the hysterectomy is the uterus because then we say you had a total abdominal hysterectomy and bilateral salpingo ophorectomy, which is the fallopian tubes and the ovaries. Oh. So, okay. 
So we're going to take a few more questions here. Um, Nikki, I'm going to hop in because I see a question that I think is an interesting one uh, coming from a male audience person. Uh, as a man, husband and father, what can I do to help be helpful with the women in my family regarding this issue? Anybody on the panel want to take that question? I think support, support, and also maybe like encouragement for like, for all of us as partners, like being like, have you gone for your checkup, right? Like people, we don't, you know, as moms and, and daughters, we don't spend a lot of time taking care of ourselves. So I think like being able to, kind of, that, that's what I would say. And I also think that even being in a room and learning about it, like, that's, a good that's point. awesome. Like just to be here and to learn about it, if more men understood a lot of single fathers um i think it would be helpful so just being in a room i think is great okay nikki you want to get a couple more questions yes so this one is interesting i had a colposcopy which was extremely painful what can be done to encourage patients to have these screenings despite the trauma um i have to say that when when i do a colposcopy I always ask the patient to take whatever form of pain medication that they use for their cramping about two hours prior to the procedure because everybody's pain tolerance is different. Yeah. So even if I'm doing, whether I'm doing endometrial biopsy um, in the office or the colposcopy, I always have them to take pain. And if I'm doing an endometrial biopsy, depending on how long it's been since they've had a baby, I actually give them a medication that makes the cervix nice mm -hmm. and soft. So it's easier to pass the little straw into the uterus. So it's, it's, it's kind of like thinking about your patients. And I guess it really depends on who your gynecologist is, yeah. but always ask questions on how they can make it more comfortable to have the procedure done. I totally agree with you. I think also like, you know, you can ask about different pain meds, like, like Dr. Peppers mentioned, sometimes I'll try to use a little lidocaine gel. I'm not totally sure it works, but for some people, they feel more comfortable. Um, there are some procedures that are in the office that some people give local anesthetic for, not all. And finally, like if somebody's like, I know was like super nervous and tense and like really didn't tolerate even the pap smear well, and I know I'm going to have to do more exams, I will offer also, and you can ask for like, hey, do you want to do this with a touch of sedation? Like some gynecologists can do that in their own office. Like I can't do that in my office, but we have like an outpatient surgery area where somebody can put in an IV and give you like a little bit of twilight. And then the whole experience for somebody who's really had like either a lot more trauma or, you know, for some reason feels like uncomfortable in the office, um, that is a really fair option to ask for. And, and, and I think that I've started to use that more and more. Okay. Uh, another question is why select an NIC hospital versus my community hospital for my cancer treatment? So I think that means like a sort of a national, like a kind of a tertiary hospital or a, like an NCI designated hospital, you know, the cancer treatment can be tricky. I think that, you know, one of the things that offers is kind of the specialty of the cancer. So like in GYN oncology, um, for example, like we just have like a lot more specialization in the type of surgery that's needed and the details of the chemotherapy and the clinical trials. So I do think that that's helpful, but that doesn't mean that you have to always like get all of your treatment done at an NCI hospital. So I have a lot of patients who I do their surgery and I work directly with their chemotherapy doctor locally or their radiation doctor. Like some people choose to get their, you know, chemo and radiation with me or with our team. And some people say, look, I can't drive for two hours to do this. And we work directly, but we're still that like quarterback piece of like, okay, like making sure that you're still getting follow-up. So I think there's a lot of benefits because of the trials and the specialties, but never feel like you need to kind of, that, that has to be limiting. You can always get a consultation or an opinion and have like a roadmap set up. And then you follow that roadmap. Okay, so guys, we are 10 minutes um, past the hour. We're going to take one more question. Um, I do know there are other questions that are here. We want to be respectful of everyone's time. What we're going to do is the questions that did not get answered, we will submit those over to the doctors here on the panel, and we will send out an email to all of the participants answering those questions. So Nikki, if you could just give us our final last question, um, and then we will close out this program. 
Absolutely. Um, this question, I have a history of fibroid cyst endometriosis and heavy bleeding. Uh, this attendee has never heard of endometrial biopsy, but has recently been experiencing more bleeding. Would you recommend they talk with their OB about that option? Um, yes, I definitely, uh, you know, I, I do a ultrasound. However, the ultrasound will not sway me not to do the endometrial. Point. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I'll do the endometrial. I'll do the ultrasound just so I know, okay, she got fibroids. Her lining looks like this. But I I was taught that, and I was taught by my gynecologist, <laughs> that you, you need to have that endometrial biopsy. So yes, I definitely say they need to have an endometrial biopsy to look at the tissue that lines the uterus. Agree. Okay. Very important. Well, thank you all for all of those questions. Those were great questions. Uh, we do have others. Like I said, we're going to take those questions remaining and send those over to the doctor so that they can ask those questions and send an email out to all of the participants of uh, today's program so that we make sure that you're getting your questions answered. I just want to thank our panelists, Dr. Peppers and Dr. Lee, and our patient ambassador, Regina Hammock. Thank you so much for participating in today's webinar. As you can see, this is a much needed discussion in our community um, just by the array of questions that we had today. Um, I'd like to also thank our co-host, Chicago Medicine Comprehensive Cancer Center and Advocate Aurora Health, including the Partners of Faith Health Network community that is viewing this presentation from Advocate Trinity Health in Chicago. Thank you guys so much for being with us. I wanna also thank our sponsor, ASI, and just everyone who took time out of your day to participate in this program. Black Health Matters would appreciate um, if you were participate in a survey. I am about to drop the link to that survey right now into the chat box. Uh, it is a brief survey. Um, your participation will continuously help us uh, put programs like this that is relevant to the community and topics like this. It, it, it will help us to continue to bring programs like this uh, to you all. Um, this is the um, barcode. Um, you can scan this for those of you all that are in the room in Chicago. You can scan this barcode and also participate in the survey. Uh, we will also be sending out a follow-up email within 24 hours um, so that you can uh, also participate in that survey. And so that is all that we have for you all today. I just want to say thank you once again for joining us and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. We have our packages. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, right, thank you guys. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks for thank having you. this. Thank you. We appreciate it. Awesome. I love that fanny pack. Oh, <laughs> thank, you, Yay. thank you and thank you dr peppers Christy, very own thank you okay bye-bye bye-bye bye-bye